This is the second part in my series about designing and building a solid state Tesla coil. In this video, I'm going to show the correct way to find the resonant frequency of a coil, how to build a better primary driver, and I'll talk about signal conditioning for the driver. You may notice this is a different coil than last time. I built this one because I needed a smaller coil that would be easy to work with on top of a table or desk. The first thing I'm going to show is the right way to find the resonant frequency, because the method I used last time will not give the correct result. To do this, you'll need a signal generator, an oscilloscope, and an antenna. In this case, I'm using a copper pipe as an antenna, but it could just be a piece of wire. The signal generator is the same design as the one I used in my previous video, but with a smaller timing capacitor for a higher frequency range. I hook its output up to the primary leads on the coil, then power it with a 12 volt battery. Then I connect the base of my antenna to my oscilloscope probe, and I begin doing a frequency sweep by adjusting the knobs on the signal generator. As I sweep through the frequency range, there will be multiple peaks. The largest peak on the scope is going to be the resonant frequency of the coil. The smaller peaks are harmonics of the resonant frequency. In this case, the resonant frequency of the coil is about 572 kilohertz. Now let's talk about driver design. In my previous video, I built a circuit that used a single MOSFET driven by a 555 timer to drive the primary coil. The problem with using a single MOSFET is that huge voltage spikes are caused when it's suddenly shut off. To protect against these, the FET will need a protection diode between the drain and source, and a snubber capacitor to help absorb the spikes. The effectiveness of the snubber really depends on choosing the right value to match the frequency and current of the primary. Too much or too little capacitance pretty much makes it useless. So that's one way a single MOSFET topology can self-destruct, by overvoltage. Now let's look at the other problem with this design. Here's an example of what the voltage and current waveforms would look like from drain to source on the MOSFET. Suppose the current peaks at 1 amp, and the voltage peaks at, say, 100 volts. Because the MOSFET doesn't shut off instantly, there will be a period of time where a large current and voltage coincide with each other. In this example, at peak current, there's 40 watts of heat dissipated across the MOSFET, at least for a very brief period. Now let's look at a typical TO220 package you'd likely be using. Its temperature increases by 70 C for every watt of heat dissipated. Let's say for this example, this 40 watt dissipation condition only happens for about 5% of the oscillation cycle. Multiplying that out means we'd see a temperature rise of 140 C. This would explain why I cooked so many FETs with this design. The more common type of single MOSFET circuit has the FET gate connected directly to the base of the secondary coil, which has the opposite polarity of the primary. The street name for this circuit is a Slayer Exciter. I have no idea where that name comes from, but they seem to be pretty popular, and you'll see them more commonly built with BJTs instead of FETs. A bias resistor pulls up the gate and begins the cycle. Current flows through the primary, and current in the opposite direction should begin flowing through the secondary. This begins to pull down the voltage on the gate, and eventually pulls it down far enough to shut it off. If it pulls it down too far, the Zener diode will break down and begin conducting from ground into the gate, which is now at potential below ground. Once the FET shuts off, current begins to flow in the opposite direction through the primary via the snubber cap, or sometimes a tank cap in parallel with the primary, which my circuit doesn't have. At the same time, the feedback cap, bias resistor, and current from the secondary is flowing into the gate of the MOSFET and beginning to charge it back up. If the gate is charged up too far, the Zener diode will break down to prevent overvoltage. Now the MOSFET is conducting, and current starts to flow through the primary from VCC to ground, and the cycle begins all over again. That's great in theory, but depending on how the coil is built and what components are used, it's very possible that the secondary current could be too small, and instead of this ideal scenario where the MOSFET is turned on very hard, you could end up with a situation where the gate to source voltage is just barely peaking above the threshold voltage. So you're still getting the current you need to operate the coil, but the MOSFET has enough resistance from drain to source that it's getting really, really hot. Let's look at this graph from the datasheet of an IRF540. This is a commonly used MOSFET, and it's what I'll be using for my driver. Suppose my gate voltage is 4.5 volts, and I'm moving, let's say, 5 amps of current. According to the graph, that would cause a 0.6 volt drop from drain to source, which translates to 3 watts of heat dissipated. At 50% duty cycle, that averages to 1.5 watts of heat. As we saw before, a TO220 component with no heatsink has a 70C temperature rise per watt of heat dissipated. 
that means the MOSFET would heat up by 105 degrees C. Now let's compare that to the situation where the gate has 15 volts on it, which is close to the 20 volt limit. Returning to the graph, we see that the voltage drop for our 5 amp example would only be about 0.22 volts this time, which translates to 0.55 watts average and a more manageable 38.5 degree temperature rise. As you can see, there's a dramatic difference in heating based on how well the secondary current is able to drive the MOSFET gate for this circuit. But it actually gets even worse for the MOSFET with poor gate current. As the semiconductor junction gets hotter, it actually has even more resistance. The MOSFET that's at 105 degrees will actually have 60% more resistance than one at 20C. In other words, the hotter the junction gets, the faster it heats up. This creates a feedback loop called thermal runaway and will cause the MOSFET to self-destruct if left unchecked. I think I've made my point here. Single MOSFET drive circuits suck, so let's look at a topology that doesn't suck, the half-bridge inverter. A half-bridge driver uses two MOSFETs. One is a high side switch and one is a low side switch. Between them, there's a load, and it's connected to a capacitor. For the first half of the cycle, the high side switch conduct and charges the capacitor up to VCC. For the second half of the cycle, the low side switch conducts and discharges the capacitor to ground, which results in a waveform that looks something like this. If an inductive load is placed in series with the capacitor, the current waveform takes on a triangular pattern and the voltage across the load alternates between plus VCC over 2 and minus VCC over 2. This works much better than a single MOSFET driver, but there is one potential problem that needs to be addressed. If there's any overlap between the switch states, the MOSFETs will form a short circuit from VCC to ground. This is called shoot-through, and it can overheat or even destroy the MOSFETs pretty quickly. To prevent shoot-through, there needs to be a little bit of gap between the drive signals of the high and low side switches. 5-10% to of the cycle is probably enough. This will ensure shoot-through doesn't occur, but it will require some signal conditioning. To do this, I built a separate board for signal processing. For future builds, this won't really be necessary, but since I haven't done this before, it helped to basically have a separate module from the half bridge to just kind of experiment on. So the output frequency is generated by a 555 timer, like in my previous video. It puts out a 5 volt square wave at about 50% duty cycle, and I can tune the frequency from around 200 kilohertz to 700 kilohertz. To convert my 50% square wave into a pair of 40% square waves, I have to utilize some logic gates. In this case, I can use an inverting Schmidt trigger, six of them actually. All six are conveniently packaged in this component, a CD74HC14E. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on from the schematic, so let's zoom in for a closer look at the signal logic. The 555 timer signal comes in and has its phase shifted by an adjustable RC delay circuit. The phase shift part isn't really important for this video, but I will cover it in the next video. The signal on the output of the first Schmidt trigger looks pretty much the same aside from some phase shift, and it then gets split off into two branches. We'll look at the top branch first, which will end up driving the high side MOSFET on the half bridge. On the top branch, the signal goes into an RC delay circuit with a diode. Without the diode, this would just cause a forward phase shift of the signal. However, because the diode brings the fall time of the signal to approximately zero, the forward portion of the phase shift gets chopped off, so you're left with a shorter duty cycle on the output of the Schmidt trigger. In this case, the trigger is also an inverter, so it makes the duty cycle longer than 50%. To fix this, another trigger simply inverts the signal again, and I get my output with a reduced duty cycle. Let's see how that looks on the scope. In yellow is the RC delay voltage going into the inverting trigger. In purple is the trigger output, and if we invert it again, we get our reduced duty cycle square wave that we're looking for. The lower logic branch works the same way, but the addition of an inverting trigger before the RC circuit moves the signal 180 degrees out of phase, and what we wind up with is a pair of square waves that are less than 50% duty cycle and spaced 180 degrees apart. Here's what it looks like on the scope when I probe the high and low switch logic outputs at the same time, and that's exactly what I want to see. Now that I have the signal, I have to do something with it. This is very low current 5 volt logic, so it would be useless for driving my MOSFETs. That's a job for a dedicated MOSFET driver. I'm using a pair of TC4422 driver chips that will take my 5 volt logic signal and amplify it up to as much as 9 amps at 18 volts for very brief pulses. The MOSFET drivers will energize a signal transformer used for controlling the gates of FETs. As the drivers alternate between high and low, current will flow back and forth in the gate transformer. So this input signal, here, 
would translate to this waveform across the transformer primary. Now before I continue, I should point out that this is a one-to-one -one transformer, so whatever voltage forms across the primary will also form across both sets of secondary coils. I should also mention one very important piece of the equation here. The secondary coils have opposite polarities in order to keep the signals 180 degrees apart. So if your low side signal looks like this, then your high side signal will look like this. If I connect my MOSFETs to the gate transformer and check the gate to source voltage of both on the scope, I get this result. The output is similar to the input signal, but there's some noticeable differences. For one, there's a finite rise time of the gate voltage due to the inductance of the transformer and the resistance across the windings. As for the wavy line at the top, that's actually ringing caused by resonance between the gate capacitance and the inductance of the transformer. Usually this can be sufficiently damped with a few ohms of resistance between the transformer and the gate. If I zoom in, you can see that the gate voltages still aren't overlapping. The lower dashed line is set at the conducting threshold of 3 volts, so there's still a decent gap between the two. There's about a 120 nanosecond rise time between the gate threshold voltage and the driving voltage of about 10 volts, above which the MOSFET has the least resistance. Overall though, this is really good for almost 600 kHz. One huge advantage of using a transformer to couple the signals is the ability to use low voltage signaling to drive any power voltage you want. See, when I say a voltage forms across the secondary coils, what I mean is a voltage difference. And this is an extremely important detail, because that difference could be relative to anything. Let's look at a typical N-channel MOSFET. You'll usually want somewhere between 10 to 15 volts between the gate and the source to drive it at minimum resistance. But what if I have a high side FET and I want 400 volts across my load? That would mean I'd need as much as 415 volts on the gate for things to work correctly. So what do I do? Build a second power supply that puts out 415 volts? There's no way I'm doing that. Luckily, I don't have to. The gate drive transformer will take care of that for me. All I need to do is connect the secondary leads between the gate and source of the MOSFET. So if, for example, I had 15 volts across the primary, I would have 400 volts at the source of the MOSFET and 415 at the gate. Conversely, if the voltage reversed across the primary, I would have 400 volts at the source of the MOSFET and 385 volts at the drain and this would work for any input voltage. The same thing holds true for the low side MOSFET, but since the source is typically connected to ground, this detail isn't quite as critical to the operation of the FET. Here's a view of the logic board and the H-bridge circuit together. The gate transformer leads are connected to the blue screw terminals from the FET drivers to the FET gates. The transformer is connected to a one microfarad cap to block DC. Here's the full schematic for the H-bridge circuit. It's similar to the basic example I gave earlier, but with a few additions. 1. There's a filter capacitor for smoothing out current spikes. 2. There's Zener diode pairs on the MOSFET gates that prevent the gate to source voltage from exceeding plus or minus 20 volts. 3. There's damper resistors to manage ringing between the gate capacitance and the transformer. And 4. There's some large, high-speed flyback diodes on the bridge itself. For the small period of time that both MOSFETs are shut off, the energy in the LC circuit will need to go somewhere, and these diodes provide a safe path. Now I'll hook it up to a 2 ohm load resistor to try it out. My scope leads will be connected across the resistor terminals. The output pretty much looks the way I expected, with the exception of the ringing, which is probably coming from stray inductance in the wires and the resistor. Now let's see what happens with a proper inductive load. This is a 3.5 inch coil with 4 turns, and there's a 1 ohm resistor connected to one of the leads, which I'll use to measure current. Because V equals IR, the voltage across the 1 ohm resistor is equal to the current, and I should expect to see a triangular waveform centered about zero. For the inductor voltage, I should expect a square wave that alternates between plus and minus VCC over 2. I've hooked up all my probes, so let's see what comes out. Sure enough, I get the exact waveforms I predicted. The triangular yellow waveform is current, which peaks at a little over 1 amp, and in purple is the voltage across the inductor. I'm supplying 12 volts, so the inductor voltage alternates between plus and minus 6 volts. As I lower the frequency, the voltage stays the same, but the current goes up. This is because the impedance of the inductor is directly proportional to the frequency, so the lower the frequency is, the higher the current will be. There's one last step to this circuit before I fire it up, the interrupter. The interrupter is simply another 555 timer, but it's operating in a very low audible frequency range of about 10 to 100 Hz which I can adjust with this knob. 
the interrupter pulls down the frequency generator signal and basically allows you to modulate the coil's output by square wave pulses. In a future video, I'll use this to create music with the Tesla coil, but for now I'll just use it to generate a single audio tone. Now let's fire it up. I have my logic board connected to a 12 volt battery and my half bridge driver is getting 30 volts from my bench supply. I also have an 8 inch metal plate serving as a ground plane which is connected to the base of the secondary coil. It's sitting on top of a quarter inch thick plastic cutting board to avoid having high voltage leak through the wooden countertop. Alright, working good so far. Power consumption is fairly modest, and the MOSFETs are barely warm after several minutes of running, so I think I can crank up the voltage quite a bit. To do this, I built a DC to DC converter with one of my ZVS drivers that takes in 12 volts and boosts it up to 80 volts through a flyback transformer. The maximum voltage on my FETs is 100, so that should give me some overhead. So here's what the complete setup looks like. The logic board is powered by 12 to 18 volts, so in this case it's off a battery, and then that drives the gate transformer, which controls the MOSFETs on the H-bridge. And then the 80 volts is supplied by the 12 to 80 volt DC converter, and the 12 volts going into it is supplied by my power supply. So let's go ahead and fire it up at 80 volts.